Humanity has been driven from Earth, but now it's time to take it back. Join the Reconquest and fight the Scourge on the Drop Zone Commander Hub at BeastsOfWar.com. The new Flames of War 4th Edition brings you the battles of World War II in epic 15mm scale. Go to BeastsOfWar.com to get the latest in news, tactics and tutorials. Hello! Our buddy Dave Taylor's launched the Kickstarter, and you need to know about it. Dave, the, you've launched the Kickstarter. This is for a book called Armies and Legions and Hordes. Now, this is a book... That's correct. ...book with a difference, so Yeah. Because this is not a painting book, mm -hmm. necessarily. Dave, do you want to tell us what it's all about? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, basically, um, I think you hit the nail on the head right there. It's... Um, I've painted a lot of toy soldiers in my time, a lot of miniatures, and um, a lot of people might think that this is going to be a how to paint faces and how to paint Imperial Guard troops and how to paint uh, Napoleonic British or whatever it might happen to be. Mm. But uh, it's not really about the step-by-step -step processes for painting. It's um, really a book about the process for organizing a large project, a large painting project. So if oh, you're going yeah. to be painting a um, hundred miniatures, you've got to take your time to work out how you're going to do that. And you've got to remember what inspired you to want to paint those hundred miniatures in the first place. Um, set yourself some goals, all that sort of thing. Yeah, because it is yeah. a completely different process. Oh, definitely. I'm finding that for the first yep. time myself with my current Hobbit army. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait. And I, and I face it. That's a lot of hobby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's um, it, one of the one of the things about painting uh, painting armies is. It's a dream that many of us. Oh, I, yeah. I, do you know what I'm going to say? All of us. It's a dream that all of us have, and we uh, we all kick into it. Because I I've I've been through this in my, in my early days of hobbying. Um, when I say my early days, my early late days. So I was adult enough to be able to afford a big army. Yeah. Okay. But I wasn't adult enough to know what I was getting into. Yeah. And I would get <laughs> I would get this big slap of an army. Okay. And uh, um, I remember doing it with uh, with uh, an army I had that was called the Sons of Eon. They ended up uh, becoming Minotaurs. Yeah. Oh yeah, Space yes. Marine Army. I I they're they're sitting in the cage, right. aren't they? Yep. I, uh, Dave, I bought this. I bought so much stuff; it was unreal. I'd got a oh, really yeah. good deal on on drop pods. I had nine drop pods. Yep. I had a, at least a couple of hundred troops. I had um, line breaker squadrons. I had. I even picked up <laughs> storm. Uh, what do you call the the, the, the storm blade? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, I picked up like oh, a, for the super heavy. Yeah, yeah, I picked up a super heavy and decided oh, I'm going to stick that in my space marine army. I had it all, and then I got nice. to painting. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it all built, and yeah. you know, and even building it was a hell of a thing because it's yeah. a huge process. In yeah, because yeah. I never I built it, but I didn't refer to my codexes, uh, uh, and so <laughs> so I was just saying, oh, this is gonna look cool on this guy, and oh, this gonna oh, look at them troops together. I had more terminators than you have ever seen in your life <laughs> because I had a real thing for Belial and the whole first company. And I thought oh, I'm gonna do a first company, and I built the coolest terminators. It wasn't it wasn't legal whatsoever in the game not. but it, it, i thought this all looks amazing i then got to priming it and then i started and i started with my first dry brush my second dry brush my third dry brush to get all the metallics down and then i gave up <laughs> i absolutely gave up because i forgot yeah. why i was doing it and yeah. and I, I just i hadn't it just every time i sat down to do the chain of it by the time i had went all the way through the entire army with it I was utterly scundered, sickened, no. desperate by the yeah. end of it. Yeah. Did, did you ever have this in, in your early days, Dave? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt that has happened to me. Uh, quite. Uh, I'm not going to say quite a bit, but it certainly has happened. Um, I still have... Uh, some people talk about having like a um, a box of shame or a yeah. drawer of shame. <laughs> yes. I like to think I have a, a basement of, of shame. shame. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Yeah, that, it's happened to me, but uh, I've also sort of spent a, spent a lot of time talking with people about how they get through those sort of um, how they've got through those humps and how I can apply that to my own painting so that I can avoid that sort of uh, sort of situation. So that's the kind of thing that I'm hoping to bring in the book is say, okay, if you've if you've tried this before and you've you've bought all the army and you've assembled it all and you're painting it 
all the way along the line yeah. to the first color and then all the way along to the second color. Let's have a look at a different way that you can approach that so that it's um so that you're not spending hours and hours and days and weeks and months and not seeing a lot of progress. You want to see progress as you're going. It's it, yeah. it's the thing yeah. that that sort of drives us on as people. We want to keep moving forward and know that we've accomplished something. Yeah, um, for all think, of our efforts. I so think that's key. Is that, in, it's it's going to talk about that sort of thing. Yeah. Having that, having that, uh, the this this to me looks like it's going to be a a big book of the best experiences. So it's uh, because you know it's not something that we get to do all the time. Unless no. you're John. Unless you're John. <laughs> Unless you're John. <laughs> Unless you're John. You know, it's a, it's, so it's not something we get to do all the time. So very few people, if anybody, are going to go into this with experience behind them. Yeah. So being able to have a reference that you can uh, draw back to yep. and see how the different types of project were tackled. Yeah. And you can look through it and say, actually, I think I prefer that approach. Or I'm doing something similar to that. I will follow that approach. Yep. You know, So yeah. I think having that experience yep. all packaged up um, into something that you can kind of pre-arm yourself w yep. with the ability to do it. Because although we're talking about yep. armies, th let me tell you, the, the biggest, uh, the, the biggest what, what do we call it, boxes of shame uh, these days are the big box board games. You know, anybody that's back to Cool Mini right. or Not yep. Project or Mythic Battles uh, yeah. or, uh, wait for it, Joan of Arc. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you're receiving, you're receiving boxes of miniatures In that are crying out. What was that, John? In the hundreds. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, and they're crying out to have paint yeah. on them. You know, it's like, you know, we could you could spend all day with Dark Souls, you know, uh, listing all of these amazing oh, yeah. games that are mm. just crying out for paint on them. And uh, I don't know about you yeah. guys, but Dave, one of my big killers is um, both myself and Sam, we battle with attention dis disorder, attention yeah. deficit. Yeah, right? but we lost the attention there. He couldn't even get to the yeah, end I, of the I, I, I don't know what, 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 I'm, what I'm supposed to call it. And uh, we, we have... We, we have an affliction. I solved it by getting a John. <laughs> <laughs> but we have an affliction where we will sit on to a project and just not know where to start. Yeah. Mm. You know, because the scale, the scale of projects uh, uh, absolutely uh, terrify me. I got a mythic, ba mythic Battles pledge, right? And oh. I am scared to even open the boxes. Justin was in there, opened all his boxes up, getting it all laid out and stuff like that. I was terrified to even open the boxes. He says, do you not get stuck in? I said, give me the core box <laughs> and I'll have a look at it. Or for, for folk well, like ourselves, yep. like, are you going right to the very start, Dave, you know, to try and help us get over that um, paralysis. That, that paralysis of, of how we'd even start in the project? Definitely. Uh, I, want to, I want to take it all the way from uh, talking about inspiration. Uh, so it could be, it, it's going to be sort of back from before you even make your purchases. Yeah. Uh, so before you've or maybe it's around the same time as you pledge on the Kickstarter for something like Joan of Arc. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I'd love to. I want to talk about the different um, different ways that that can be approached. So, but the key thing is making sure that you understand what you're like because we're all different. Yeah. We all have a different approach to the hobby. Um, but if you understand that you are going to be sort of overwhelmed by that many miniatures. Uh, Got to work out a way to sort of take bite-sized chunks at mm -hmm. it. It's a, that old sort of adage: How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Yeah. So it, it's going to take you a little while, but if you know that rather than trying to fit it all in your mouth at once, you can make goals that you can feel good about as you're going through the process. Yeah. So the secret is to not try and fit it all in your mouth at once. <laughs> I wondered how long and, it was taking you to pick up on and, that. And Dave Taylor. Said that to Warren on PC. <laughs> you can, you can, you, you can take that to the bank. <laughs> yeah, I've been watching you guys for years now, years, and I know that you just you, you don't like to bring it up yourself, Warren. You know, you no, like no, to, no, absolutely you always not. Little, a little lead in. <laughs> right. And, um, Man. We were very fortunate, actually, that Dave uh, has done a, a kind of a precursor article yes. series yes. Um, on Beats of War, where he's been looking at um, uh, just kind of scratching the surface on, on some of these themes. Yeah, I've been looking over them, actually, for approaching my own 
Hobbit one trying to take a few points from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been proving very useful. Well, if I can quickly talk through um, some of the phases here, Dave. Okay, um, uh, so I want, I want to kick off with your first article series, which was uh, basically about um, inspiration. You know, it, so it's kind of a, a big thing for for any of us is yeah. to where we get uh, our, our ideas from. Like John, we've been through this and are just coming out the tail end of it now with yeah. the Personians. Dave, we wanted to create, um, we wanted to mix two passions. Um, a passion we have for Napoleonics and a passion that we have yep. for 40k Imperial Guard. So we thought to ourselves, sure. could we could we take in the grandest traditions, because like the, the Imperial Guard, the the way that they, they were structured, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful types of Imperial Guard. Yep. You know, and we thought to ourselves, you know, we could we could probably pull this off. And and what we I say we, yeah. mostly me. I've been working through this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Mostly John. I've been working through this project. But um, what, what, what kind of places do people get inspiration from? Is it just crazy stuff like the uh, like that, or you know? So what, what has inspired you over the years? I, th I think there are a lot of different places that um, the people draw it from. Uh, I'm I'm primarily I primarily enjoy the sort of the craft side of the hobby. So the painting, the modeling, converting, um, creating a, an aesthetic or um, changing an aesthetic, that sort of thing. Yeah. So for me, it's primarily been things like the uh, cool artwork, um, color schemes, mm -hmm. uh, seeing something that you know, color scheme really grabs you and it's like, I want to apply that color scheme to something. Um, and I always also enjoy the like background. Um, so a lot of for, for fictional universes, the all the stories and um, and the background that it's created for those uh, for historical projects, it's finding a, a great story um, within the sort of the history of that that army or that regiment, yeah. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a lot of there are a lot of people who prefer the uh, sort of the ro rules side or the gameplay side of um, the, uh, of the hobby, which for them, it might be, oh, here's a great way that this game, that this army can play yeah. on the tabletop. So yeah. it might be the inspiration for them. It doesn't just have to be, oh, here's a cool picture. Mm -hmm. um, it can certainly be, here's a cool, I'm not going to say trick, because that might sound a little bit sort of disingenuous. A cool piece here's of a cool way that I Yeah, cool. Actually... You know, it's, um, yeah. I can't see any reason why you couldn't be... You, you couldn't create a cool project around a cool piece of meta. Oh, definitely. You know, it's um, you, you, yeah. and, a, and a prime example of that is, you know, anybody that ever uh, wanted to create the the Deathwing. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, the, the the Deathwing army. You, you you had a cool piece of meta where if you feel the Belial at the time, you were able to have an old Terminator army, yeah. and it was it, it, it was it was a rules mechanic that unlocked the ability to do something that was just really, really cool within yeah. the Games Workshop universe. I remember one of my first exactly. uh, one yeah. of my first projects in Warhammer was to try and start converting a Death Watch army and I got the shoulder pads from uh, Forge World and was starting to convert those marines that Justin gave me. Mm -hmm. And then Games Workshop released a Death Watch army anyway and I was just like, well <laughs> enough oh, of that one. Oh you gave up. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Okay. Uh, uh, Actually, I uh, wanted to ask on the on the subject of inspiration for uh, color schemes and everything. What, uh, John, what, where did you get the inspiration for the Personians on that? Oh wow! Well, the Personians were a bit of a a mix between you and I talking about this one. Yeah, it? me and so John mixed well. We so we, <laughs> we <did>. do occasionally. <laughs> yeah. Well, with the with the right amount of mixing medium. Yeah, and well, patience. it was really a case of you know we, we obviously we were going to take a bunch of Napoleonics. And start strapping las las guns yeah. and things like that yeah. to them. But uh, at the same time, you you wanted to try and um, pick a color scheme that would look cool on the tabletop, and had maybe been sort of done in history. So because, recognizable. Yeah. Well, it no, wasn't to make it recognizable. It was the fact that those guys had already worked out what looked good going together. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's like so you know you were starting to pick. So we we opted for the blues and. And things like that, because again, they were uh, personia. Uh, pr they're, it was loosely based on Prussians, yep. and the Prussians kind of wore this very dark blue or black and gray kind of yep. color. So we were able to, to pull it from that. And a lot of the time, um, you know, as Dave, uh, uh, I'm sure, will talk uh, in his book. You know, when you're picking color schemes, there are certain rules to color theory that just kind of work. 
and if you're wanting to try yep. and take the work out of something, it, it, you know, people in the anus, or sorry, not anus of history, the anus of history, <laughs> have, have, have already kind of I, established. I think it's you, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <sorry. laughs> That's not thank, much better. Thank you for that, Dave. And I fitted that all in my mouth. <laughs> yep. But in the, in the in the anus of history, it's like, <laughs> people have worked out a lot of that color theory. You're just trying to get me to do theory. the shock face again, yeah. aren't you? They've, they've worked out a lot of that color theory. So, you know, it, it, there are certain things that, that will go together and for a big project uh, i don't know dave if um, if you will find this and, and if people that, that get involved in this will find this but for me um sometimes in big projects you need to take some shortcuts mm -hmm. and for me it's enough yeah. of a shortcut to do something that takes the thinking out of it a little bit yeah. that you're not having to yeah. sit and procrastinate and overthink for every single step you do yeah. so you know when you go with blues that whites will work well with blues, that reds will work well with blues, that golds and silvers and stuff will work well with blues. Yep. You're not trying to put blues yep. and purples and greens and things all to all together into the one thing. Now, blues and purples and greens all together, but in the hands of the right painter, um, with, the, with, the, the, with the right amount of time, no, no, not necessarily. <laughs> he could maybe pull that off and make that absolutely beautiful. But when you're facing a larger project, especially larger projects where you, you're trying to fix yourself to a time scale, okay? Mm. And no yeah. project goes well if you give yourself an unlimited time scale, Dave. And I think even for us as hobbyists, you can't just say, Agreed. I will take as long as I want. If you ever want to finish something, you need to set yourself some well, sort of goals yeah. to be able to do it. Well, that was the point of the next article in the series, setting goals. Well, there we go. The aim. The aim. So, Dave, <laughs> do you want to take us a little bit through the, 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 the process of goal setting and, and the likes? Sure thing. Um, basically, uh, I, I think you're you're exactly right. You hit the nail on the head there again. With uh, we need to set ourselves some sort of deadline, um, a goal uh, that includes um, timing, includes that deadline or a timeline, uh, includes a um, an event or an activity or a, a purpose behind. Uh, really, it's creating a purpose behind doing the project. Yeah. So um, some of the things I talked about there were yeah. um, like preparing for a tournament is a classic one. Yes. That, um, a lot of there's a lot of events going on, so it's always like um, I know I, I've got a lot of friends who are currently sort of madly painting to get things finished up for Adepticon next week. Yeah. Uh, so that they can take their army along first time they've sort of put it down on the table in front of a large crowd and they're really excited to have something new and uh and that sort of thing on the tabletop so that's their goal success basically the goal is what success is going to look like for you so success for them will have be to have this new army on the tabletop um but yeah, yeah so that's really what the, what the goal is so when you if you're thinking about thinking about okay i'm not sure what my goal should be just sit down and think about what what do you want to see at the end? What what does it look like? Yeah. Um, create a go on a vision quest or something <laughs> yeah. like that, but but kind of work out what it's going to look like. What's going to make you happy at the end of the project? Well, for for anybody that's watching, there's um, there's some other articles rather than uh, uh, run through all run through all of them. But Dave goes into talking about setting your expectations, a big one in this. Um, your planning, motivation, heroic failures, triumphs. It's all in there. Yeah. But before that, uh, aside from that, Dave, you've sent us some some images of, of some of your projects. Um, I'd love to take a uh, take some have, time to yeah. run through some of them and, and, and have a have a have a chat. Um, so sure thing. Kicking off, what have we got first, John? The, the Imperial Guard, I believe these are. Dave, it's a grey Imperial Guard army, is it, mate? Yep. Um, is that you got a picture of the squad sort of marching across yeah. the screen? Yes, that's them. Yep. With the dead horse. Yep. With the dead horse. Yeah, the dead horse is tragic. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, um, one of my favorite projects that I worked on, uh, I worked on it a while ago, but um, was this army, the Jenswick Thirty uh, Third Rifles. Mm -hmm. uh, it was inspired by uh, a passage from I think it was um, the book Straight Silver from the Gaunt's Ghost series by Dan Abnett, mm -hmm. um, put out by Black Library. And uh, there was basically it was a regiment that was had been on the front lines of this war for over a century, uh, and they were 
mired in trenches and mud and had very much had that World War I feel uh, to them. So I took that inspiration and I turned it into a 40K army, um, I mean, the Imperial Guard Army, uh, with all sorts of things. And around that time, the uh, the Bretonian Men in Arms plastics had been released. Yeah. So I wanted to create an army using those Bretonian models and Cadian arms. Cadian plastics had just been released. So I was able to mash those together for most of the inf infantry and then create other things that tied them into that look and feel. Of, of the World War One Army. Yeah. So that's we're a, just, we're just a, it's a crazy at the, mashup. It's much like the the Presonians. Yeah. Yeah. We're just looking at the, the the images of the the artillery pieces for those guys, and oh my god, <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> I yeah. am in love. Dave, tell us a bit about how you how you planned those, or what 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 you went through to create those. Well, one of the things that um. The, one of the visual aspects I really like from um, sort of World War One uh, and from the history of World War One is the big artillery pieces uh, and the the huge wheels with these track uh, sort of uh, elements on them, yeah. so that they didn't get they could be pulled around yeah. through the mud and not get stuck. Um, so I, I wanted to create a big gun like that, and so I made the wheels first, and then when I put an Earthshaker cannon in between them and was like oh this shaker cannon looks really small mm -hmm. i've made the wheels far too big <laughs> and then <laughs> several people who were standing around me at the time said no 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 you just need to put more guns in yeah yeah I, I sort of bodged together four earth shaker cannons and um, built the rest of the um piece around there with plastic card and mm -hmm. and other bits and pieces and uh yeah created those huge guns and as far as using them on the tabletop at the time, there were no rules for sort of how to do that. Uh, a little bit later, when uh, sort of Apocalypse was released, and used that big sort of clover leaf template. Yes. Yes. Um, you guys remember that? Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It was like, okay, well, I'll just create some. It'd be an Earth Shaker that uses that template, and you sort of roll randomly to see that like you roll randomly three times or four times, see how many blasts you get, or where the blasts are. Uh, and then uh, Forge World released, I think it's the, the Minotaur um, artillery piece, the one so with, I could one use it for team. that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so there's lots of different ways to, to do that, but the important part for me was to create something that was cool and iconic and an awesome centerpiece for the army. Yeah. I, I particularly so. like how um, that is one of those cases, one of the articles was uh, Heroic Failures. Mm -hmm. and. That was one of those things that initially you thought might have been a failure, where the gut wheels were too big, and then you turned it into something awesome by adding the extra. Yeah, it was it was cool. But yeah, it, again, that's um, part of that was had I just been sitting at home myself and being like, oh, these wheels are too big. Let me find a smaller pipe to base them on, kind of thing. Yeah, I could have created something smaller, but interacting with other hobbyists is is key for a lot of this. I worked at Games Workshop at the time and there were a lot of other hobbyists in the office uh, who could provide me with feedback sort of straight away, uh, which was good. Uh, but now they can certainly do that on, on forums, for example, like the Beast of War forums. Yeah. Uh, it's a great place to get feedback and, uh, and sort of have people sort of help you build on your ideas and create something really cool. Yeah. Now you have a couple of historical projects in as well yeah, that have yep. just they were just screaming out at me. Um, one of them just um, it terrifies me. So if you, if you get, click on that top this one top there, one yeah, there, yeah, it's an it's a Napoleonic um, army. It, it, it's the British. Um, yep. Uh, and it's just beautiful, Dave. It is it's just absolutely stunning. But man, dear, that, that must have took a fair bit of project management to get through that. Uh, it took a little bit of time, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a funny thing. I've always um, previously, I'd always said uh, Napoleonics is where war gamers go to die. <laughs> uh, but what I when I started actually getting into it myself, I realized it's it's one of those things where you can, if you once you get into Napoleonics, you could spend the rest of your life just yeah. playing with Napoleonic sort of models. There's so many different 
uh, scales available, so many different theaters, different armies, different mm. uniforms. Uh, so much happened over that period uh, that you can get some sort of cool stuff going on. But the, the, the reason I wanted to include the, uh, the Napoleonics, the, the British there, um, who are part of my British in the peninsula, so uh, fighting in Spain and Portugal, um, the reason I wanted to include them in the book is that I came from a GW background where once you pick a color scheme for your army, that's the scheme that goes across the entire army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, with the, the Napoleonic armies, well, it was like, oh, I'm going to have to paint hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of red jacketed guys. Yeah. It's like, um, oh, wait, what, what color are the artillerymen? The artillerymen in, are in blue jackets. Yes. Well, that's interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Oh, what about the, the skir these skirmishers? Oh, they're the rifles, the 60th rifles. Oh, then they were in green jackets. Well, that's cool. And if I ally in some uh, Portuguese cathedrals, yeah, uh, they're in brown jackets. It's you've got the opportunity to sort of break up all that red by um, painting different uniforms yeah. the same sort of thing goes for the french you don't just have to paint blue you can paint some white and some yellow and some pink uh, but yeah that's why i wanted to include those guys in the book mm -hmm. um and then a bit further down there john we mm -hmm. see um Osea sherman <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm, I'm surprised that John didn't just race down the page. And yeah, and you, I thought John would have brought this up before anything else. Uh, Dave, that that is a very very nice Sherman man. Yeah, I, I had a um, lot of lot of fun painting that. I actually I painted that up for uh, for Warlord Games for their uh, paint one of their painting guides. Yeah, and. I, I'm I'm not sure if I I might have gone overboard a little bit with the weathering, no. but I, I wanted to to put those sort of rust streaks on because they look fantastic on that uh, sort of the drab green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, but, uh, it's a lot Thanks. I haven't I haven't painted the World War Two American Army yet for the project, mm -hmm. but it's something that I want to include in there. And what are we talking about there is um, accessing. Or using models from a variety of different manufacturers. Yeah. So, again, as for myself, growing up, I guess, within the, the Games Workshop sphere of things, it's like, well, you get all of your stuff for games from Games Workshop. When it comes to something like uh, historicals, you've got such a huge range of um, companies to choose from. Yeah. Uh, so I want that to be the focus of that sort of army feature. Awesome. Right back to the Kickstarter. Yeah. Okay. Um. So Dave, it, yep. it, it's a it's a Kickstarter to create this uh, to create a book. The book is yep. both physical and an electronic version. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got um going to be doing a got the physical printed hardback version mm -hmm. that I want. Uh, just kind of I guess it's kind of like a vanity project, <laughs> really. <laughs> but it, it's been really cool. I, I've been involved in the creation of a lot of books. Um, do a lot of layout and photography and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, being able to create my own book from start to finish is going to be really exciting. Yeah. Uh, but also, yes, a, a PDF version as well um, for folks who would prefer to have it on their tablet or on their computer or that mm -hmm. sort of thing, um, which is absolutely fine. And um, one of the cool things that um, that I'll get to tackle that I haven't done yet, uh, if we. If the stretch, if if the campaign goes well enough, um, I built into one of the stretch goals, the possibility of turning that PDF into a uh, like an e-publication. Oh yeah. So like an inter interactive thing, so we can have some video clips in there. We can have some figure spinners. We can have extra photos. Oh, that would be very All the sort cool. of things that you could do with an interactive um, EPUB. Yeah. So. Fingers um, crossed it'll go well, and then I can learn how to do that as well. <laughs> and for anybody, uh, anybody backing from the UK or the US or Australia, and New Zealand, um, uh, do you have uh, partners in place for the from the shipping of the books? Or I, I do. Uh, yeah, I've got um, you know, working with uh, somebody in the the UK to, which will help uh, sort of basically get rid of that uh, sort of customs fee. Yeah. Uh, that. Can be a problem when things are shipped from the US. Um, so that will work for UK, the EU. Uh, I've got a, a partner in uh, Australia as well who's going to be shipping around Australia and to New Zealand. Uh, so hopefully we can start to cut down those um, really what seem now particularly high 
um, shipping fees yeah, and uh, customs fees and that sort of thing. You also have yeah. um, a few guest spots in the book, yeah? yeah? I do, I do. Um, it, as I said uh, earlier, I've spoken to a lot of people about building armies and painting armies and regularly completing projects. So I wanted to uh, include the perspective of, of people who do that on a regular basis. Uh, so I've got some... Um, some friends of mine, so uh, Ash Barker from Canada and uh, Brandon Palmer from GMM Studios. He mm -hmm. does uh, huge armies. He does, for yeah. Most of the time. And uh, and also somebody who's sitting not too far from you guys. Mm -hmm. Who Justin? could My slave! <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say Warren, for sure. <laughs> Warren, yeah. It's all right, nice. Dave. Yeah. I taught him everything he knows, man. <laughs> so you've done a piece for the a, a piece for the book as well. I have, yeah. Because yeah. uh, you've done a few armies in your time now, John. A couple. <laughs> <laughs> a couple. Um, I've written a little piece on inspiration, like what gets... Mm -hmm. What gets the idea from your head onto a miniature, and yeah, done a, a couple of things on it. So I haven't let you read it yet. You've read it. I've read it. Yes. And Dave's uh, only recently received it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, are there any yep. points of inspiration you can let out? Well, I think I'll ask Dave because he's read yeah. it. <laughs> save, save it for the book. Oh, save it for the book. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a very quick straw poll. I can totally see the the need for this for me. Yeah. Right? Because um, uh, as I as I witnessed firsthand the. The hardest part of painting an army is not necessarily the painting, it's it's understanding the process of yeah. getting an army on the table. Yeah. And we are all at our happiest. Let's let's not beat around the bush, but we are all at our happiest when we have big armies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we all want big armies. We yeah. do. Because you know, an army doesn't look magnificent unless it's big. Okay? So True. I can see uh, uh, the value in this and being able to to lean on Dave's experience, your experience, and the experience of uh, guys at GMM Studios yeah. and some of these other places. But as someone who does uh, the, the armies, because you you worked quite a bit with Dave um, uh, back and forth, even behind the scenes yeah. on getting a, a you know a, a fresh perspective when doing the Personians. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who already paints, what's your what's your take on on I this? I think if uh, what what I would like to see from the book is just other perspectives other mm -hmm. than mine, and it's kind of partly the you're not alone, John. Other yeah. people do this, John. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I like to see how other people would approach the similar situations and you know army building and painting and that sort of stuff. Yeah, because I mean it's it's something that I've more or less bar the the chats I've had with Dave in the past. It's something I've more or less had to come to terms with on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even while working here, there's it's still a very sort of. I don't have time to even go and look at how other people do that. So arms. having a reference of that collective knowledge, yeah. um, it, it seems to be it seems to be a very very interesting take on it. And I like the fact um, that it's the not another how to paint book. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, because there are a lot of how to paint books. You know, the, the world is coming down with articles and stuff on on how to paint. Yeah. yeah. We we have. It's nearly a thousand videos uh, uh, locked into backstage on how to paint. Yeah. But the uh, the whole prospect of of looking at it from the perspective of how to organize the project, yeah. um, I I think is is really really interesting. I, I can't wait, Dave, to to see how this all comes together, mate. One of the things I I really like about the, the idea of making it, it that process driven sort of approach is that it doesn't matter how you paint. Um, yeah. Whether you're just starting out painting or you've you paint um, fantastic looking miniatures uh, or wherever you are in between. It doesn't really matter. It's the same process of going through mm -hmm. and organizing yourself and organizing your time. So that's the, that's the thing I wanted to, wanted to help as many people as possible. Yeah. So regardless of what level you're at, yeah. the, yep. the ideas and the concepts in this book uh, should help you unlock huge armies <laughs> well that's the hope anyway yeah well look, look, so. hand it to so, me yeah. and see if it works yeah, yeah well we'll get it, we'll get it you for your hobbits <laughs> there we go right. dave look thank you so much for joining us mate best of luck with the kickstarter um uh, we'll try and reach Thanks out to you uh, to see how you're getting on a bit later on mate i really uh, really want to see um how this goes for you um right so you know what to do uh, go across pledge and then you like me We'll give it to your own, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody.
Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now, and be sure to check out beastofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.